and there we are. Hi, yeah. everyone. <laughs> it's Sir Rithkin, and I'm here with Duke. Oh, no, I should have asked you, is it Alaric or Alaric? I'm an Alaric. I'm Alaric. one of the many, and, and to be honest, I just go by Duke George at this point because there's like 15 other Duke Alarics now, and I have to stand out somehow, so. Okay, so. But Duke Alaric is fine. Alaric is okay. absolutely fine. Yeah, because I looked you, I mean, you've lived in a couple of kingdoms, so I looked you up and like one, one you have this like Roman name, Alarcus Sartiano von Drachenclaw, and then exactly. the other one, yeah, okay, um, cool, so you've seen these before, mm -hmm. um, I usually start with your origin story, um, so why don't you go there and I will uh, do the thing I have to do behind the scenes while you do that. Okay, um, I was watching Highlander, and then I decided I had to learn how to sword fight. No, uh, no, actually, I, <laughs> I, uh, I was playing, I had, I, I was in college. My first encounter with the, with the SCA was at a Dungeons and Dragons tournament in a mall in Columbia, South Carolina. And I looked at those people and I said, it's fun enough to play this game. I was like maybe 12. Uh, it's fun enough to play this game, but those people just take it way too far. They actually dress up and that's just plain weird. So here we are, you know, 50 years later, 40 years later, and you know, whatever. Um, but then uh, I was in college and my friends were talking about this SCA and they really sword fought and they were making their armor. And, um, you know, these are college kids making their armor with, you know, a, a utility knife and some vinyl or some, you know, flooring materials. And I'm like, that stuff looks like, crap. so, so they're like, oh, we're fighting Saturday, come over. So I went over to their house and um, out of a nice truck, got one person who was about 30 years old. We were all like 19, 20 at the time, or I was eight, I was 17 actually. Um, and uh, he put on a real suit of armor and he looked great. And that was Baron Sir Jason Michael of Andover. And I said, okay, my friends look like idiots wearing carpet and stuff, but this, this is real. People do this for real. I can do this. It's not just my nerdy friends. So, um, that was my entrance into the SCA, and I made my first suit of armor out of flooring. Actually, it was a conveyor belt. It was even worse than carpet. It was conveyor belt. And, um, you know, I had a spun top helmet just like everybody else, and we went from there. So, you know. Conveyor belt legs were very big when I first started fighting. <laughs> <laughs> The worst part about the conveyor belt that we had, it had like these knobblies on it. And I've seen other people use it for the soles of their boots since, but we wanted it to look better. So we put the knobblies on the inside and you can imagine how that went for us. Interesting bruises, probably. More like, more like a severe carpet burn. Oh, geez, geez. okay. Uh, how long did it take you to get armor that you were proud of? Um, within a year, I graduated from the conveyor belt. I, my second suit was actually made from a, um, a water skiing life vest that I hot glued a melted and flattened and slightly shaped piece of PVC pipe into for my, as my kidney protection. And, um, I know it, it, we were dumb, like, you know, we just... <laughs> And uh, then I had a really nice surcoat that went over everything. And I had a nice set of shoulders. Um, I was, you know, I, elbow was attached to a elbow, like an elbow pad and no van braces because, you know, we were stupid. And um, yes, Branos, I don't care. Van braces are a good thing. Um, and uh, I had the, the spun top, but I looked, I, I suddenly, went, you know, the surcoat was really, really nice. So in 1989, I went from looking like a guy wearing a conveyor belt to, wow, that guy looks pretty good. But it was all because it was all covered up, you know. Sir, sir uh hide all sorts of oh yeah stuff. Okay, um, <laughs> I've never heard anyone use a life jacket as armor before. That's it was first. great. It was the water skiing one, so it was only it was like foam that was about that thick, and it fit. I was a little. I weighed like 145 pounds okay. at the time. So it fit perfectly, went right under the cir or the surcoat, and because it was nylon, the surcoat would move over it, and it's just, I don't know. All right, cool. That's cool. We were, we were stupid. So, so how did you get over your sort of like dressing up as dumb? And um, oh, this was ten years. You know, it was like okay. years later, years later, okay. and literally, literally when when Baron Jason, it was like 
the sun, the, the ray of sunlight was shining upon him. He had an embroidered surcoat. His helmet was made by, by Valerius. So it was one of the first really nice bassinets in the SCA. Um, and he had his, his whole gear. He looked like a knight. He looked like he walked out of a picture. So, and, and he was a in shape, super cool guy. So I was like, that's the, that's a cool guy. Like if a cool guy can do that, then I can do it. If that makes any sense. No, it totally does. I think, um, you know, people always talk about putting rules in place to like hide, hide labels or plastic. And I think actually the most effective form of that is being inspiring and looking good so other people want to look like yeah. you. I agree. Uh, I agree. I, you know, when, when I was working on one of my master's degrees, I actually wrote like a 30 page paper on kingdom. I'm going to call it kingdom etymology, where I showed how in different kingdoms, there was an inspiring figure in each kingdom at the time. And you could look and, and show how every other, like in on tier, there's a certain armor type in Atlantia, there's a certain armor type and shield type and, and break it all down back to one person who was the cool person who started that and everyone was emulating them. That's pretty cool. I, how, how did you do it for kingdoms you'd never been in before? Uh, I've been to most of the kingdoms and I've went to something like um, 20 straight Penzix and I spent almost two weeks at all of them. Went to Gulf Wars, went to Estrella's, you know, all the all the big things. So I didn't necessarily go to the kingdom, but I met a ton of people from everywhere. Yeah, it's it's amazing how long lasting those effects are too. I, I'm imagining on tier with Steingrim or Torgal or some, one of those guys. Exactly. And, um, it's you know we still are are predominantly a Viking kingdom, even though people keep moving in that aren't. And, right. Um, or, yeah, so it's interesting. That that's a super interesting project. Um, I would love to see that sometime. If I, I think can it, if I can find it and dig it up the hard drive it's on somewhere, I, I'll happily send it to you. Um, but it was that was 15 years ago I wrote that. So that's like that's like history, right? Like um, I had all know? the pictures. I had all sorts of attachments. Really? Oh yeah, it was it was wow. a great paper. Wow, that's so, that's super cool. I'm, but I'm I'm totally getting off on a tangent. So, so no, 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 it's totally fine. That's that's why I'm saying let's. I don't want to just go through the same list of questions. I'd much rather talk about something like that. That's a little different. So, um, I I, I will uh, say something here that that uh, you asked like, how do I know a lot of stuff? I I got around. I fought with everybody and I did stuff. So, back in the early 2000s, there was a um before Facebook, there was this thing called the Armor Archive, mm -hmm. and um. I was pretty heavily involved in that community for a long time. And one time someone put up a list of all the combatants in a crown tournament. So in my wisdom, I created a new account named Dark Apprentice. Are you the Dark Apprentice? I am the Dark Apprentice. Cool. So, so when you ask like, how did I know everybody? I literally pretty much knew everyone. I would write up odds and comments on people from oh, yeah, all, around, all around all around the world. And people are like, how, who is this? And that's actually how some people figured out who, who I was. Like everyone kept it a secret, but um, they, they, they realized it was me because I moved around from coast to coast and I kind of knew everybody. And there's like, there's only one or two people it could possibly be. And then when they read the humor and certain comments they're like, oh, you I, I get a private note like, hey, is that you? I'd be like, absolutely not. So um, yeah, it was, I had a couple uh, a couple people who would sock puppet the account for me every now and then just to, I'll out them. It was like Nissan Maxima <laughs> would, would take over the account every now and then just to throw in flavor, but that well, was me. You were scarily accurate. I, I had yeah. a, I had over an 80, not just an, high accuracy rate for who would win but actually for how they would place in tournament as well i was scarily accurate so tell me about your love of following that kind of thing um because i think it's fascinating i i to go back kind of to the origin i was obsessed with fighting so um i would walk across campus and i would i'd practice the my muscle memory as I'm walking across campus, like this is a butt wrap, this is a butt wrap, this is a butt wrap. And um, any video I could find, I'd, I'd watch it. And then at these Penzix for two weeks, I started, I didn't necessarily even want to fight certain people, but I would stand near 
the good fighters as they were watching someone else just to overhear their comments and look and say, oh, they're watching the foot. Oh, they're watching, you know, look, look how the shield is moving. This, this angle's wrong and start picking that up. And then as I got better, I was allowed to sort of start taking part in those conversations. You know, I was, uh, and I was super lucky. Like when you go to, Pen in, the, in the early nineties, when you went to Penzik, the first week, there were only like 1500 people there. But a lot of the people there were kings and dukes and stuff who were going to set up their camps. So I really was the benefactor of a, the super top end level of instruction. That I would get a concentrated class with, for a week with uh, Branos, for instance, who was one of the most everyone, world known, one of the most fantastic yeah. teachers ever. I used to get him for a week at a time. And over, over the course of five or six years, you know, his influence on my fighting, uh, some of the other people um, was, was unreal, you know. Uh, my footwork and learn of distance control and stuff like that from him, we would just stand and, and work on that. And then I'd watch him do it against other people. Uh, you know, now I go to a war and, and people aren't even doing pickups. And I'm like, do you really ever wanna be good? Like that's the most important part of fighting is, is that out of, you know, out of the, the tournament or out of the battle scenario, like go fight the best guys. They want to fight you, go do it. So do you think even now it's worth going to that first week of Penzik? Like, and are there fight practices with all these Dukes and stuff still? I haven't been for about five years. So okay. I, I, I don't know anymore. Um, there was a five or there, there was a a while where if I had to make a choice between going to first week or second week, I'd actually choose to go to first week because the fighting for me was better. I, I, after a while, a, a war scenario is a rinse and repeat. I do the same thing every time. They're like, you're fast. You're going to run down here, cut around and hit their back end. Same thing over and over again. I do it really well. I don't even care anymore. It's boring. Um, but uh, I want to learn from people and although the pool might be a little smaller, their availability is much higher because there's only 10 or 20 guys who are on the field and y'all, it turns into a mega practice, you know, or, and anytime you're doing that, it turns into what you want to get out of it. You can just fight people or you can say, hey, I saw you throw the shot. Can you show me how to do it? Let's work on that. And most people will, especially if they're just standing on the field all day. Okay, cool. Um, so can you sort of, you say you're, you're, you are obsessed with fighting. It sounds like you're Absolutely. still sort of obsessed and um, passionate. Uh, a little bit, not as much <laughs> um, as I used to be. <laughs> so when, when you were really working to get your prowess up, um, what kind of things were you doing? I was going to three practices a week. I was fighting on the weekends um, and I was getting in some kind of aerobic exercise on the other days, like um, I'd go for a run or um, I'd go out dancing with friends, you know, so, something fun, but something just to keep it all moving. And um, anytime I could find a video, you know, I would scour the armor archive for people putting up a video of something and I'd watch them over and over again, breaking it down. Like, and I'd go to a practice and I'd watch and listen and what, and, and, and that's really uh, one of the other things, like you have to take the time to watch what other people are doing and start building up like a battle computer in your head of this guy moves his leg this way, his shield always drops as he's throwing this or she's throwing that. Um, and then I've, I've also been really lucky because during the time when, you know, over the first like, let's say eight years of my fighting, uh, I, I had a nice solid curve of uh, getting better. But then that like year eight or nine, um, I had the opportunity to work with Duke Edric. We worked at the same facility and uh, one of his squires. And every time we'd pass each other in the halls, we'd stop and we'd shadow box for a moment. So we had that in addition to fighting on the field. So breaking it down and going slow and saying, how did we do that or something really helped. And I, I think one thing that a lot, of, a lot of guys do who are coming up, I'm using guys generally, I apologize. I know it's That's fine. Anyway, um, uh, is that um, take the time to practice. You know, I would go to a practice and I'd say, 
every fight, I'm going to hit them on the offside leg, and I'm going to, then I'm going to kill them with a flat snap when they're on their knees. Or I'm always going to, I'm going to, I'm going to throw the jump wrap and see what's going on. Like work on something specific. Don't just go and fight. You're not going to get any better. You're not going to know what, where your deficiencies are and where you can build from. So do you have um, a really good memory or do you take notes? Yes. Because... No, I, okay. I, I, can, I can tell you shots that were thrown in a fight in 1995. Okay. Like shot for shot. It's ridiculous. It, I'm a movie person. I don't know if you know that. So like um, I can see a movie once and start quoting from it. And so that ability kind of transferred over to fighting. And I can tell you about fights I had in the 90s. It's, it, I'm lucky that way, but I think, I think if you had to take notes or if you wanted, you know, something like that, just to help you remember what you're working on and why, just so you can, you can build up that wealth of knowledge. Like, um, I don't know if you've ever done this, but there are fighters I've programmed for over a year before a crown tournament, like letting them think I make a certain mistake over and over and over again. And then, um, walking into crown and doing something different at that moment and whacking them very hard because they thought I was doing the, the thing that they saw me do for a year. And they, it was a, it was a year long fake right. is what it was. You know? <laughs> so that, that takes commitment. There's, there's a level when, when you want to be the best, there's a level of commitment that you have to give that's above and beyond just going to practice. You know, when, when you want to start competing against the Michael Bedfords and the Bronises and the Lucans and give them what they're giving you, you better believe they're going home and they're doing the same thing. They're doing their homework. They're not just showing up on Wednesday night and then once a month going to a tournament. They're doing something else. Like everyone does their thing. I don't know what it is, but you have to pick what your thing is so that you can press above and beyond. Otherwise, you're just going to be another person on the field. True. That's true. Um, okay. So you started in the East, right? I started in Atlantia. Atlantia. Okay. Then, then I went to the East. Then I came back to Atlantia. And then I went to Kaid. And then I went to the middle. And then I went back to Atlantia. And now I'm in the West. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, so you were, who were you squired to? Count Sir Arlof O'Donovey of Aaron Moore. And which kingdom was he in? Trimeris. Okay, so explain that. <laughs> so he uh, had just completed a reign in Trimeris and um, had completed his graduate degree down there. And he and his wife at the time, um, he took a position at the university I was going to. And uh, Duke Kuhn introduced us at a um, Sea Wars. I didn't know who he was prior to that. And it turns out he lived just a couple miles from me down the street. And um, I was able to go over to his house. He had a Pell. He had everything set up. He's like, anytime you want to come over and work out, feel free to use the Pell. So I'd go over there like on the way home from school. Like I said, I got fairly like two or three times a week. I'd help him on projects. We would start working together. And um, it was funny, prior to that, I was like a 14th century guy and uh, he was Romano Brit. And he's like, oh, Romano Brit's where it's at. And I'm like, I don't know about that. And then he's like, uh, and, and Trimarian short sword is the finest single fighting weapon you can use. So he had me switch from an Atlantean heater to a, a rectangle and a 24 inch short sword. So I spent a couple of years. Uh, well, it, I, let, I let it kind of grow back up to a 30 inch short sword. But um, for the, believe it or not, for the time and place, I weighed like 150 pounds, maybe 155, and I'm 6'1. So learning to have to get inside and overcome my fear of getting hit by other people and just staying at range. Uh, and with the short sword system, I could hit people three, four, five times um, and just kind of outspeed their defense after a little while. So for me, it worked. I, I was, because I really just couldn't hit people super hard at the time, like not one big overwhelming shot. Um, 
so I was able to, to hit over and over again, and that worked. And it also helped me start developing a, a sense of flow and in combination with footwork that um, I was able to, to build around. And then when I was, then I, when I went back to longer sword, it, it had already kind of gelled and was, you know, it, it formed a really good foundation for me. So what, what do you, what's your usual fighting tools? Like, what do you like the best? For the majority of my career at this point, I've literally used the same uh, VDK style heater or not heater, uh, kite shield. I've had the same shield for over 20 years. I've had the same helmet for over 20 years. Um, and I've been using a uh, 38 inch sword, either tip weighted or basket weighted, depending on what kind of fighting I feel like doing that day. Um, but I've used everything from a 42 inch sword down to a 24. So can you explain um, what's the difference for you for with a tip weighted sword versus a basket heavy sword and how your fighting would vary? Sure. Um, so with a, a tip weighted sword, I'm trying to keep someone at range and, and like use jabs to change their momentum or their pattern and use my footwork to move in between their, their blows so that I can open up their deep offside generally and uh, hit them in the armpit or hit them in the back, something like that. And the, the longer sword really helps me control that sort of range, the tip, the tip weighted sword does. When I feel like going to something where I want to step in and brawl, then I'll go to the basket hilted sword because I'm really trying to hit you about you know, that far above the end of the basket. And I'm using, I'm using the, um, hold on. So, sorry. So like these hilts have a, a big end on them and you use that to, this is what's guiding where the sword is going. And then you're using, you're just kind of changing it at the last moment. And it's a, it's a much harder hitting style than the other. So there are people who need, you need to, pick that up against yeah. to be um, polite call that the right cross <laughs> you into exactly the exactly <laughs> um yeah okay um is that like on on the i know that we're we're looking at your basketball early but is that like a, a like a weight at the bottom so this is this is a knockoff of um michael bedford's style hill okay. uh and what he does he has the built-in um, sword, okay. you know, up, up yes. top. But in the back, you drill through and you put a, screw, you put a screw straight into the back of the basket hilt. So the back of the basket hilt, as you can see, is really the back end of the sword. So you have a nice weight here. And um, on a 36 inch sword, you're using all 36 inches of the rattan. Right. You know, you're not losing that tail on the end there and okay. uh, and then just the shape of this really helps with the the flow of a of an end weighted sword when you're using a tip heavy sword um what kind of basket hilt do you use i used to use um the illusion aluminum spun aluminum hilts but i've broken them all and i use the plastic ones now just because they're easily available okay cool um so you got knighted in kaid is that right correct okay um how long were you in Kaid before you got knighted? Under a year. Under a year. All right. Yeah, um, I won I'd won I'd won 22 tournaments in under a year. So um they in kind Kaid? Of, yeah, they they bunch of them called up back to Atlantia and they said, Who is this guy? What what did he who did who did he piss off in Atlantia? And they're like, Oh, um this why I understand. So they're ah. like they're 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 like, Oh, nothing. We just didn't knight him. Nothing wrong. They, the funny thing is in Atlanta, they all thought I was a kid because I was very slightly built and very young looking. So uh, at, at like Penzik 27 or 28, maybe, we're all sitting around in a tent after, after all the battles, like the Woods Battle for that day, and everyone's sitting around having a beer and we're all talking. And someone's telling this story about Penzik a couple years beforehand, this funny story. And then I'm like, oh yeah, and you tripped over him and you did this and that happened. And, and they're like, how how do you know? And I was like, I was, I was standing right next to you. They're like, no, you weren't. You've only been fighting a couple of years. I'm like, guys, I've been fighting like 10 years. They're like, you're not that old. I'm like, 
I've been authorized since 1989. I've been, I've, you know, and and I think the light suddenly went off. This was like a month before I was moving to uh, Kite at that point, and uh, the light finally went off. Oh wait a minute, maybe he's. I, I'd finaled in their crown. I'd done some other stuff at that point, but no one put two and two together that I really wasn't uh, an 18 year old kid. They all, they all, people get locked in of, in the yeah. SCA, you know. Yeah, and the SCA is interesting too. Um, when we're going to events, um, you know, it's it's not a year. It's like you've seen the person three times, right? So right. time will pass, but it won't feel like a long time. Exactly. Um, yeah. It's so, I. I have I have a whole set of friends who I realized that they they were my pen like my Penzik friends, and I would spend every day with them for two weeks, you know, fourteen days. And then you think about how often you really see some of your regular friends, and you might see them ten times a year. And I'm like, I actually am seeing some of those Penzik friends more than I was seeing some of my real life friends. So, and in a more intense. Exactly. You know, like living together situation. Exactly. So, yeah. Um, it's, it's kind of a funny thing that, that, and I, and I think sometimes when you start really early, like you did, that it's hard to break out of that mold that you created as this young teenager. Um, yeah. yeah. And that's why, that's why when I moved to Kaid, I suddenly, well, I was also out of college finally, and I was working, had a job. So Pete, there were certain assumptions that weren't being made anymore about me. Um, so, and, and I very quickly stepped in and in Kaid, they just never seen the fighting style I was using before. And between that and me actually being pretty good at the time, I was, became rather dominant, rather, rather fast out there. Um, did you have a mentor in Kaid? I didn't have a mentor per se. Um, Duke Edric, who was Count Edric at the time. He and I were like just a couple months off in age. And uh, at one of my first events, I met him and we started going to practice together. And we, he became my fighting partner. We pushed each other. We really pushed each other from being like really pretty good, like good fighters to being really excellent fighters. Like he, we, we were able to always find something new each one of us and bring it to the table and force that next level out of each other super cool um, yeah it was, it was it yeah and he was in excellent shape and just like you need you need a, a person like that for your i'm going to quote um one of my favorite movies the last dragon um if you've never seen it about bruce leroy where he goes to his master and they play the song it's the final level like you need someone like that to push you to the final level. Okay. Um, cool. Um, all right. Uh, so you got knighted in Kaid, um, and then you won crown like a year later, right? About a year later. Yeah. Okay. Um, were you going for crowns before then, or was that the first one I'd, you sort of went for? I'd finaled in a crown in Atlantia prior to that, and I'd finaled in a crown in Kaid prior to that. I The first crown I finaled in Kaid uh, was nine, no, it was exactly a year, yeah, exactly a year after moving there. Okay. And did you, I think before we, we, we went um, live, you were telling me that you don't fight for someone you're involved with, is that right? That's correct. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I have, but, um, since then, I've kind of given it up. I just see too many relationships and obligations and things that kind of get messed up um, by people who aren't truly committed. And um, if I if I fight again in another crown in the future, I would fight for my fiance, who will probably be married by the time that that happens. But um, uh, it, that's different. Um, but but when I was, it, I just saw so many people not doing it, and people talk about different inspirations. When I was really driving myself, I was my I was inspiring myself to achieve. I wasn't looking for anything outside. I didn't need it. I focused within. I didn't look without. So, you know, that might change in the future. Like everyone has to have a focus point to to be able to, to try and get better, and that might be doing it for someone else. For me, it was literally I had to overcome my own mountains for me 
I, I like that you say that because I think that people romanticize um, the game a little bit more than maybe it actually deserves. Uh, the game and the fighting part is what I'm talking right. about. Because if you're going to work at the level that you need to work to be competitive at a crown level in at least the, you know, the kingdoms that um, have more than eight people in crown or whatever. You um, want me to talk about that. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> then you you have to you have to rely on yourself to be motivated and dedicated and and keep going and a lot of it is self motivated and if you, it's not you're never going to get there. You have to find that motivation. Ultimately, I think it does come down to yourself. Like um, if you really want, I used to drive two and three hours each way to go to a practice once a week. Um, you know, and and that if that doesn't come from yourself, then, then the other person has to be so committed to either they're going with you or they're giving you the freedom to go and do that. And I also recognize that I was lucky enough for much of my developmental period that I didn't have outside obligations. I didn't have a wife and kids or, you know, I, I was still in school. I was doing graduate work or whatever it might be. So I didn't have the, the nine to five job I had to go to. So you know, I, I, I was lucky in that way, you know, but everyone's life develops differently. And um, I was able to, you know, do things like drive two and three hours each way to go to a fighter practice. Not everyone could. Right. And then in, here's the weird, the odd thing about Kaid that a lot of people don't realize is if you live in, in LA, there are 12 baronies within a two hour drive. So you know, um, to my my friend Stuart and I, we went to four events in one day while I was king. Seriously? Seriously. Wow. We got up really early one morning, hit the first one, did an opening court, went to a second one, did a lunch court, went to a third one, did an afternoon court, and then did a closing court at the fourth event. Wow. Yeah, we were insane. We that's that's why. But that, you know, I was younger. We had nothing. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. That's interesting though. Like does Paid, I, I guess you don't live there anymore, so you wouldn't know, but when you were there, mm -hmm. um, did they have like regional practices? Because I find like in Seattle, there's, there's, I think six or seven baronies within a two hour radius. Mm -hmm. It's like all divided. Right. And we don't have a super practice where we push each other. Right. Um, Is it the same down there or? There were a couple like really well-known practices. Um, I don't know if they'd be called regional, but if it's only 45 minutes away, I mean, that's a regular drive for a lot of people. So that's not a big deal. But the, um, the San Diego practice, the Califia practice used to have 50 to 100 people at it every week. Yeah. So, you know, I had a squire who was down there and I would go and hang out with him, especially if there was an event. I'd go down there for the weekend and hit the event on Saturday and then go to the big practice on Sunday. Um, just because, you know, that was, it was huge. Uh, and then there were a couple other practices that, that had 20 or 30 fighters at them pretty regularly as well. So did you, you said something about how you like to reinvent yourself. Sure. Um, can you talk about that? Uh, you know, you look at some fighters and they'll they'll pick up a really small shield or something, which I personally, I kind of find that insulting to other fighters, but that's me. Um, you know, I'll, I'll change my persona. I'll change my, my name. I've, you know, changed my name like 14 different times now. And um, it makes it I'm, really hard to track you down, by the way. Yeah. Well, there's not much video of me. <laughs> I, I can't find it uh, because most of my my real fighting time, I kind of retired from tournament fighting because I just don't get the same um, thrill out of it anymore. And if I go to a tournament, I'd much rather, say, step aside with Duke Cohen for 20 minutes and work out with him than sit around for five hours going through each round of a tournament and fighting, you know, what, seven times or something? That That's not a challenge anymore. So um, I got my new membership card. iron guardrail yes it did <laughs> does he know or he knows now now he knows 
<laughs> That's hilarious. He's going to kill me. Um, so, uh, no, I, I've changed my. There was a tournament in in Kaid where uh, this is my first summer there. Um, if you were an unbelt, you could enter up to three times if you did not have your uh, grant level fighting award, which I didn't, surprisingly, Atlantia hadn't, didn't have one at the time or I didn't get it because it was for teaching or I don't know. And so I was able to enter this tournament three times. If you had your grant level, you could enter twice. And if you were a knight, you could enter once. So I had to come up with three different names for myself. I fought as myself, I fought as Elvis of Memphis, which I can document, and I fought as Spicy Spice. So um, <laughs> the semifinals of this tournament it was Leon the Mirror anniversary. It had like 50 people in it. The semifinals were me versus me and me versus Duke Ivan the Illustrated. Nice. So that's, you know. How did you do the you versus you? I literally, they're they like, oh, we'll just call it. I literally said, no, 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 we're not just calling this. So I went out on the field, I picked up a sword in each hand and, and I fought myself and glanced and missed and did all sorts of stuff. Then I threw one shot and I like clocked myself right in the face and I stepped back and I went, no way that was good. And everybody laughed for a moment and then I went back and I, I died and I also won. Yes. Did you, did you win against Ivan too? Um, no. No. I, I won one fight in the two out of three in the finals. And I also lost him in the semifinals. So he was really good. Yeah. Yeah. I was pretty um, good. I was pretty good. He was really good. So let's talk about reading a little bit. I mean, sure. um, I nobody really talks about the dark underbelly at all. Oh, it reading. sucks. Yeah, um, I'm sure. Um, what what are some of the things like without you know um, being too naming detailed, names without naming names? Yeah, without naming names that like you walked into that you would have never thought. Uh, giving, being in a barony and giving someone who's clearly deserving an AOA or a GOA and having basically half the people walk out on you because they didn't like that person, um, things like that. You just, you don't know, like, and it's, it's not a big deal to you, but apparently it's a big deal to a lot of other people. And there are messes like that, that even if you've been ingrained in a kingdom for a long time you might not realize or you might not know and um the other tough side is um not not necessarily being as well versed in a kingdom's cultural anthropology that uh, they might their tradition or something like that might be different from what you're used to or know so um might be as simple as something, you know, like on the on the East Coast, they, you know, they say vivat. On the West Coast, they say huzzah. You know, stuff like that. So you you might walk into something in a kingdom that that you just didn't even realize existed, or there's a relationship you weren't aware of. Um, you have to do your homework, and you know, I was able to somewhat overcome that by in my second reign by reigning with someone who was an old school Kaiden player and kind of knew a lot of stuff and knew a lot of the, you know, she was so amazing in helping me out with, with that kind of stuff. So, you know, the, and then, you know, you, you, you end up in, you end up getting caught in other people's politics and it's nothing that you want to be involved in, but because you're king or queen, you're sovereign, you don't have a choice. And, um, you have to make some decisions or, or decisions are made under your authority that, that you, uh, you, you get stuck with kind of for the rest of your life. Like um, Kaid had the last uh, authorized light fighting group in the SCA, which is Chennai fighting. And under my administration the second time, uh, we wrote them out of the books. We made it no longer a on the books kind of, of thing. And there are a lot of people who still, you know, got very upset by that. 
Yeah, I, th I didn't even know it was a thing until I talked to um, Mansour um, and he told me that's how he started. And I, I'm like, that's not what we consider light fighting up here. Right. Well, well, you know, fencing really, you keep in mind that in a lot of kingdoms, fencing has only been around for, well, I guess it's been 20 years almost since yeah. I reigned. Uh, not less amount of time than than this was and this was the the secondary activity for years and years and years at penzik they used to have whole battles that were done with shanai really yeah wow i didn't yeah. know that not not necessarily on the books battles but okay. you know 50 100 people would would uh down in in the bog where the bog area is now that used to be the woods battle area and they would go down there with shanai and spend the afternoon chasing each other around with shanai in the woods so you know, it's, there are a lot of changes that yeah. happened yesterday. So somebody tells me I need to ask you about your ducal coronet. I, well, well, I think that's not what they actually mean. <laughs> oh. um, my ducal coronet, I, I, it's somewhere, I, I don't even know where it is. Um, it's actually my, the coronet I used to wear the most is my county coronet, which I sent to Cameron in the middle when he got his county. And um, under, and I, I wrote a note with it saying, hey, when, when you get your duchy, send me my cornet back. Well, <laughs> He's never got his duchy. Apparently, apparently it's, no, he, he did. Apparently it's oh. been converted to his ducal cornet at this oh. point. So that's my ducal cornet story. Okay. Okay. Interesting. I, okay. My, sorry, my kid, my kid is telling me I'm being too loud. Okay. Um, so you, you obviously are like obsessed with fighting, but you've only won the crown. Um, mm, sort of. That... There's, there's an asterisk next to my number of wins. Okay. So tell me about that. If you're willing to. Uh, in one, for instance, um, I won, and uh, my opponent and I were both kneeling there, and he didn't look very happy. So I said to him, "Hey, what, what's up, man?" And he's like, "Well, I kind of thought I got you with a, a thrust to the body." And I said, "Well, you know, I, I, pretty sure I picked it up with my basket hilt, but, um, and you shoved my basket hilt into my body. But if you think it's good, um, you win. I don't care." And he's like, really? I'm like, yeah. And I've done it twice already. I don't want to rain again. It's a job. And if you want the job, it's yours. So, um, you know, six months later, he comes up to me. He's like, well, I watched the video and you were right. It was your basket hilt. I'm like, all right, there you go. So huh. that's happened. Stuff like that's happened twice. Twice? Yeah, I lifted someone in the air with a thrust and it wasn't good and was told later that there are reasons why they didn't take it. Interesting. Um, like hmm. they chose not to take it. That's what I was told. No names there. I love the person very dearly and I agree with why they did it. So I don't have a problem with it. I, you know, let's let's talk about video for a second because sure. you're one of the guys from you know the great fights of youtube that goes on on tuesday nights i'm plugging it because it's fun and Thanks. you guys are doing this whole series now with um different you're focusing on different kingdoms correct um which is inter uh, i'm not going to say interesting um it's yeah. fascinating <laughs> to focus that's on the whole them. idea yeah um so let's talk about video and and it as a tool because it's obviously something that you um use right correct um so i don't know tell me what you get out of it and how you how you look at it when you watch it there there are a couple different things um you know i look for i i watch video of other people more than i watch video of myself i know that other fighters watch video of themselves um I'm looking to see what other people are doing and to kind of program that into my battle computer so that I can not have to think about it during the fight. So it becomes a reflex and I'll watch the same stuff over and over again so that the neural pathway is shorter than it might be. I don't have to be cognizant about what I'm trying to, to watch on the field. I can just see it and know what, what's gonna happen next. Um, 
and I'm looking for various tells. And um, if I see something that's really interestingly done, I look to see how and why it worked or what the body mechanic might be on it. You know, um, is the person just really strong, for instance, and they can force their sword to go a certain way? Or did they really use a, a, a fluid mechanic to get it there? What, what's going on? What can I, and then what can I steal and adapt for my own use? So, um, you know, back in the day when I didn't have a car, for instance, um, and I was in college and I was stuck there, watching the five videotapes of Atlantean crowns I had over and over again was the only way that I could immerse myself in, in that fighting. So it's just something that I've continued to do over time. Um, and it's a way that, you know, like, like we were talking about earlier, like, how do I know fighters in on tier? What were they doing? Well, I watched, you know, 400 hours of on tier fighting. So I knew who the people were and I knew what, what they were going through and how they fought. So with, I, I want to sort of talk about, and somebody says, Stuart says it was three times, not two times. Um, what? Do the one, crown thing. Oh, was there another one? I don't know. No, it's, um, it's, it's just as far as I remember. Oh, I don't know. Um, do you think it's easier for you to let go because you are already a Duke or is it just something that like you're just, you know what I mean? Like, so, so my goal, I'll, I'll, it's easy to say. My goal was when I was very young was to be the best. I'm not, I'm never going to be there. So that my, my second goal was to be in the club, you know, and um, I got in the club. There's no, there's no going above that. There's no other level. There's no, you know, it, it, who's the best on any given day, you know, who doesn't have a hangover, who doesn't, you know, who, who didn't twist their back, whatever it might be. But there's 10 or 20 guys, girls who are out there who are in that group at any given time. And um, maybe it, it's been 20 years. So it's, it's a bigger circle at this point than it was 20 years ago. Right. Um, if you're in inside that circle, you're inside that circle. And once you're there, you're looking out at everyone else. And um, it takes a huge pressure off of you because you're not having to try to achieve to, to make it to a certain place again. You know, if, um, if I walk out on the field, I can walk up to, you know, like, let's say, let's say we're at Penzik and there's a group of guys from the East in Atlantia standing there watching fighting and it's um, Brian and Michael and Lucan or something, whatever. I can walk right up to them and I'm part of that circle. It's, they're not looking at me like, who are you? Why are you here? I'm accepted in that group um, and I've kept my subscription up. So <laughs> uh, I'm still allowed to, to be around that. And once you're in, that circle, it's very different from trying to achieve that. So your focus can change. You can start working on different things like how does my outfit look? How does this flow? What's, you know, you're not trying to impress anybody. You're not trying to have to do this stuff. You can start, um, the pressure's just completely different than what it was when you're trying to get there. Yeah, I just like, people have quit the SEO over last, right? Like, I mean, people not taking blows or, or interpreting the fight different has been an issue for forever. Yeah. Right. So, um, yeah. Go back to the formation of the MSR in, in the East Kingdom where, uh, what's his name? Bob Fox, I think. Um, and the movie, if you've ever seen Knight Riders, is based on this, um, where uh, he, he basically was in the finals of crown and someone wasn't taking shots and he quit and formed his own group. It's been happening for... 40 years. Um, there's just a, the, the, like the biggest loss for me with the situation we were talking about earlier was not for me. It was for my consort. She's never reigned now. Right. She's, she's the one who lost out. I didn't need, I, you know, it's like I get some thrown out to my own big deal. I don't care. Been there, done that. Don't need to do it again. Um, when I, if the situation was correct, but uh, she's the one who lost out. And for her, it meant something. So that's my loss is that she didn't get to do 
something like that. Not not for me. Right. Um, one of the reasons I don't fight tournament anymore is because I don't, you know, I spent one year where I won over 20 tournaments. I don't, I don't need to do that again. If I want to fight and, and see where I am, my challenge is to say, you know, who's here on this field? You know, who's here today? Let me go and test my medal against that person over on the side. I don't need to, you know, that's, that's where my push is. That's where my excitement lies at this point. So you, you stay motivated um, because you love fighting and you love yeah. to see where you are in the, in the pecking order right. um, and right. the way for you to do that as pickups. Right. Yeah. Very specialized pickups. Um, like I, at this point in my career, I don't care how I do against a guy who fights pole arm. I don't, I don't care how I do against someone who walks out with two sword. I mean, I, there are some two sword fighters. That I'm very interested in finding out how I stack up against them. But I'm not going to walk off the field and be like, oh, my ego is crushed. That guy just beat the crap out of me. It's, um, I, I was a tennis player as a kid growing up. I was a ranked tennis player. And you learn very quickly that um, if you're playing against a left-handed player, that's completely different than playing against a right-handed player. So your measure of skill against a left-handed player is something that you, you know, if, if you're not used to the, the ball spinning the other way and curving the other way, you're just not used to Right. You don't have any practice against it. So you, you're, you're, if you let that break your ego or your concentration, then you're not kind of looking at it the same way. So if I go out and fight, say, Maynard from Ethelmark, who's an excellent polearm fighter, very successful, a Duke in his own right. I think he's won like four or five times at least. Uh, the only measure I get against that is fighting against him. So if I fight him once a year, and he's fighting against sword and shield guys all the time. How is that a test for me? You know, other than can I throw myself in and instantly pick up on someone and what they're doing and this other stuff. But um, so that's kind of where, like, I don't have that same sense of loss for fighting against something I'm not used to. I think that's that's a really great insight because it's it's really about taking your ego out of the equation, right? And and um you're doing that in a way where, you know, you, you stress importance on different things, but anybody could take that same mindset and, and sort of have more fun fighting because not everything is a, a value judgment of you. Right? No, no. And, and, and you have to decide what you're setting your goal for. Like, um, long time ago I was at, and it was, Ice Dragon in Buffalo, New York, and Osis had come over, Duke Osis, he wasn't a Duke yet at this point, had come over, and um, it's a bear pit uh, kind of points tourney, where there's like four or five lines, and everyone, he, he was running through like fighter after fighter after fighter after fighter, and no one was touching this guy, so my goal for the day, my, I gave myself a success goal of, can I leg him, let alone beat him, and I liked him twice. So I walked off the field, giving myself the small goal. Give yourself a small goal every day. Don't, not every day has to be this. Every day should be that. Like, did I throw my flat snap better? Did I, did I land the leg? Like, like I was saying, I'd go to a practice and say, I'm going to leg everyone and then kill them with this. That's my goal for that day. Not, am I going to dominate at practice? No, you have to go into practice. You have to practice is about practicing. You know, you can spend a whole day losing every single fight in practice and have a very successful practice. It's not about winning every time. It's practice. You're learning, right? I mean, that's that's ties into the whole victory conditions thing, right? Yeah. yeah. Practice. Practice isn't about victory. Practice is about practice. Right. Right. And about getting better at things. <laughs> exactly. To get better, you got to try them, and to try them, you're going to lose some. Yeah. Um. I was I was working on a shot where I would duck under a flat. I'd, I'd either duck under or divert a flat snap and come back and hit someone in the offside as their sword was too far around, making it impossible for them to block. I worked on that in practice for almost a year before I started landing it, and I got hit a lot. I lost a lot of fights, and there were a lot of people like, "Oh, I can beat Duke Alaric." Oh, whatever. I'm like. Well, we're not really fighting. Okay, I'm working on something. The timing. Yeah, the <laughs> timing to duck under you is that right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm working on something. You're fighting. We have very different goals. And and that's one of the great things, like like I was saying about earlier, you asked about a mentor. 
I had a training partner who understood we would work on things in practice. And that was much more important than having someone who was not, not, not more important than mentor, but that was a super important part of building my career was having someone who I could go to practice with and say, hey, I need to work on uh, like a drag tip flat snap. Can, we, can you let me throw that 50 times against you and tell me what I'm doing wrong or whatever it might be. Like you have to have someone who understands what that is and then is able to like work with you at the level that you're at, so. I like that. Um, my husband does that for me quite a bit. That's um, the biggest, you, you can't ask for more in a, in a training partner. Yeah. That's um, excellent. They're very patient, that, that's always nice. Um, and, and hopefully they reciprocate and, right. and you reciprocate, right? I, yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're almost, I guess we are at an hour now. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm free. Okay. Um, well, are, are there any topics that we haven't talked about that you would like to talk about? Uh, off the top of my head? Not really. No, I no. mean, we can, we can talk about anything, anything you want. <laughs> we, we haven't, none, none of the weird questions have popped up yet, I guess. So. Uh, no. Um, yeah. Christian Thomas says that you guys worked on mechanics for hours on end into the wee hours of the night. Exactly. I, he was my roommate for a while. And again, having an excellent training partner to work with, you're asking questions of each other and you're, you're saying, why do you do that? And what, and, and sometimes you're like, I don't know why I'm doing that. Maybe, you know, let's, let's, let's examine the shot, let the trajectory of it. Maybe I can shorten it. Maybe I can, you know, find something else I can do. And, and you just get lucky having, certain people to work with. And if, if you're, you know, um, Viscount Carl von Susen from the East, uh, he, he reigned as Prince in Drachenwald years and years and years and years ago. And he's the one who kind of told me that, like, like sometimes you have to be illuminated to something that seem, might seem obvious or easy, but he, he's like, yeah, I was in Drachenwald and no, there was no one really great to practice with. And he's the first one who kind of told me, he would go to a practice and he'd work on just legging people or he'd work on X or Y and getting that whole idea of your success or your victory, your victory condition being that small thing for each practice and building on that each week is really much more important than just walking in and, you know, being the greatest. I think um, another thing that's super important is not to be afraid to ask questions because no. Even, even if you watch, even the Dukes are asking each other how they did things and they're Absolutely. still learning all the time. So ask questions. No, and that's, and that's, you know, tournament isn't really the place to talk. Practice is the place to talk and learn. Um, and that's what, that's one of the great things about going to that first week of Penzik was for me, was because it's not just about asking questions. It's just as important to listen because there are other people around you who might, you know, um, anyone can have an insight into a, a fight because they saw it from a different angle or whatever it might be. And they can have seen something that you didn't see. Uh, like for the longest time, Duke Lucan throws this deep offside that hits people and cracks their ribs, you know, that kind of thing. And for the life of me, for I couldn't figure out what he was doing until finally I just asked him one day and he said, well, you're stepping with your left foot. I'm stepping with my right foot. And I was like, oh, oh, that's the difference. Like going back to one of my first tournaments ever, this guy just kept hitting me and kept hitting me. And, and he was left-handed. And I'm like, what? I finally said, what are you doing? So I can't hit you, but you are doing and you can hit me. And he, he was the first person who was like, I, took the point, I take the point of my shield and cock it over this way. I don't leave it in its regular spot. And I, I do that against righties. And I was like, thank you. And the moment I did that, the fights immediately changed because there was a, a something that you ask and learn about. And, and um, I've always been very open with people, like, like any random person walks up and says, how did you throw that? What did you do? I'll take the time and show them because there've been enough people, you know, I'm paying it forward. There've been enough people who, did that for me that I owe it to the community to do it for for the new person up and well it could be an old person it doesn't matter there's no if we share our knowledge and share what we've learned 
we make the community better and then we all get better as a result. Right. So, so people who kind of, you know, you can't come to my practice if I don't know you or like, I, some, I, I understand private privacy, but I won't show you this or I won't work with you. I, that's not my game. I, I don't, I'm not good with that. You know, let's, let's share and make it better for everyone. Because if, if someone figures out how to beat you, then you get better because you have to figure out, you know, how to evolve and adapt to that. Yeah, when, when I first moved out to Kaid, for instance, um, they, I threw this super deep offside. No one there was throwing it. And in the Knights community, you know, as I started winning tournaments and I was doing, uh, my success ratio was going through the roof. And um, in Knights Council, I was told this later, uh, is that they were they were saying, oh, he's just a flash in the pan. As soon as we figure out what he's doing, we'll shut him down. Well, you know, over over like the next three or four months, I went to Penzik. I had another master class lesson at Penzik. I came back with something new. I redeveloped. I re-added. I, I I did this over and over and over again. And you're always adding in something new. Stay one step ahead. And I think that's where especially some of these great fighters who've been fighting for the better part of 40, 50 years at this point and are still at the top of the game right. is because they're still innovating. They still have a love for it. And, and they're, you know, they're stealing from all the best people around them and amalgamating it into their own style. And they're able to stay one step ahead still. This is one of the only, only sports that I've ever seen where people who are older, are still the most successful people. You know, if, if we, we sit around and we make lists of the best fighters sometimes because we're bored. Yeah. And <laughs> the people who were on it when I started fighting, half of them are still the same people who are on it today. You know, so um, how, how is, you know, how are some of these people able to maintain that? And yeah. it's, it's yeah, and you hear Branos talk, and he says he's in the best shape of his life now, you know, because yeah. he's working out, and, you know, and I don't know, like, he and Ragnavall are sort of blow my mind, because they, they go, get the, they're they get to fight more every consistent week. fighting than anybody else, like, I've ever heard of, you know? There are and, a couple, there are a couple other people who I put in that same kind of group, um, and some of them have taken a little bit more of a break now, and, and they're slowly, um, kind of falling away and that's you know one of the unfortunate things about our sport and I call it a sport that's fine is that um a lot of the good fighters of today will never know how really good they are because um they we we, we will never be able to see them tested against some of these other greats who have now either gotten broken or quit or let them walked away or, or whatever it might be. You know, I would love to see certain fights, you know, like um, Miles from here in the West is an amazing fighter, but I don't know that I'll ever see him fight against Branos or, or, you know, some of the other, other greats from 20 years ago or 30 years ago. That's true. So somebody asks, what new things are you doing today to push your game to the next level? I'm just watching a video and analyzing. I'm, I'm, I've changed my workout to I'm doing intervals now rather than just straight running. I think they're better for the activity that we do. Um, I built the first Pell I've had in probably over 20 years. Um, so I can start working on some of the shots that I've been building in my head for 20 plus years. Like, can they even work? <laughs> um, and then, then once we have the opportunity to start fighting again, I, I'll, I'll go to practice. And what's weird is I, I like going to practice way more than I like going to a tournament at this point. I'd rather go to a really good practice than go to a tournament. Yeah, I, I'm kind of in that same boat. It just, <laughs> uh, it's just more fun to it, hang it out is. and fight pickups. It is. Yeah. And then go back to someone's house and have a barbecue or whatever. No, that sounds like a perfect yeah. afternoon. <laughs> it really does. It's like, that's the perfect weekend for me. Um, yeah. So 
All right, we sort of already looked at your sword, um, but is there any other things you do special to your sword that we should look at? I make the, when, when I'm really competing, I might carve a handle. Um, but when I'm also practicing really hard, I'm going through a sword a week. So I don't, I, I'm kind of lazy. I make duct tape rope and I wrap, um, I use sanded rattan, inch and a quarter sanded rattan. Um, with one layer of strapping tape on it and for the last eight inches, I spiral wrap it both ways so that it maintains a little longer, but they last a week, maybe three weeks if I'm really lucky. And, um, but the duct tape rope on the handle, once I put my glove on there, it does not move. It, it stays. So um, you actually have to move your hand inside your glove to get the, the sword, like, I'll rotate the aspect, uh, the blade aspect in my hand so I can throw a different shot and make sure it lands blade on. Um, but that grip, that's not going anywhere. So I, and then I just straight, I straight strapping tape the sword and then I put where the, the strapping tape, the two big pieces of strapping tape don't quite touch. I cover that with the blade. So I make the laziest, lightest swords I possibly can. <laughs> That's what I do with the blade too. That, that little teeny weeny part, you just sort of- I just cover that way, exactly. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Okay, um, Sean says that when he puts together his next practice, he'll let us both know. Mm. So, yay. <laughs> Hopefully next guy. April, I, I would love that. Whenever it is, I love that guy. Yeah, all right. So let's do the final 10. Sure, um, sure. I sort of changed these up a little bit, but- um, you know, if, if there's one you don't want to answer, just let me know. Uh, what event have you never gone to that you would like to go to? Sport of Kings, I think. Next year, August 19th through the 22nd. Or either that or um, Adult Swim, yeah. one or the other. I think you would dig Adult Swim because it's all pickups. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah, and I know everybody. It's like, yeah, it looks like it's a blast. It looks like it's the perfect event in some ways. Um, so one, one of those. Yeah, actually, I think you would like both of them because there's pickups all day long at Sporty Kings too. You don't have to fight the tourneys. Um, and, can... and and the thing, the thing about tourney that that makes it difficult. Here's the funny thing. It's not the Dukes I'm worried about in the tournament. It's like the mid-level unbelt who has something to prove. I can hit that guy 10 times or that girl 10 times and they just don't take it because they're focused on, I've got to beat this Duke or I have to look good or whatever it is. And that's just not a fun fight. That's why I don't like fighting in tournament anymore. You know, it's why is it I can beat Duke so-and-so, but I can't beat junior person who's not, you know, that there's a, and, and that just makes it unfun. Well, I mean, I think that's true for anyone, right? Like, yeah, I, absolutely. Yeah, I, I have this thrust that's very fast. And um, if I throw it and one shot somebody, I 85% of the time, I'm going to be told it was basket hilt or shield when it wasn't. Exactly. It just super sucks. I, yeah, and that's why I used to double tap or yeah. triple tap or quadruple tap. If you could fight anyone in the world, who would it be? Uh, are we talking about right now or in their prime? Any, either way. Okay, it doesn't matter. Um, the single most fun fight in the world is Duke Guy of Castle Kirk. I will fight him anytime, any day, anywhere he wants and love every moment of it. I got to fight him at Onchair West War um, 2019 and it was a blast. That guy is blast. Yeah, I, it, you, it doesn't matter who the winner is. It doesn't matter who the loser is because you're both, he he just, whatever energy comes out of him, you just- And he gives hundred percent. Oh, absolutely. Like there's just a level of love there. So yeah, that he's the one, he's absolutely the one. What is your favorite Pinsic story? Uh, that I'm allowed to tell? Yeah. Right. <laughs> there are no bar. I mean, if you want to tell it, you can tell it. <laughs> um, my favorite Penzik story. Uh, geez, there's so many. I went to. I I, I spent over six months of my life at Penzik. So, um, there was the the wrestling match where um, my old square brother and I challenged 
to professional wrestlers to a wrestling match. And I think our combined weight was less than both of our opponents, either one. Oh, God. Um, Viscount Nik Niklos and Shaka from the Bog. And they, um, I got a concussion. They ended up sitting on me. And then we had a huge party afterwards that was, you know, glorious. Um, that was a blast. Cool. We, we used to do stuff like, um, there was one year that my knight said, come with me. And we went up on the hill and we had these rolls of um, white plastic. And we put a like full size version of the white horse of Uffington on the Penzik Hill wow. over the course of one night. So there's stuff, just stuff like that. Like I got too many Penzik stories to tell. We don't have time for that. Let's move okay. on. All right. Um, who are your favorite people to watch fight? Everybody, I don't, I'll, I'll watch fighting. There's something different to get out of every fight. Um, you know, uh, if, 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 if there are certain fights going on, I go out of my way to go watch it. Um, Michael Bedford and Brian Tarragon used to fight every Penzik. And I would make sure that through my little birds that I know when they were going to go fight because that was a fight that you had to watch. And then um, I like watching, you know, big name fighters fight pickups much more than a single fight because a single fight, there can be a fluke, there can be an accident. You're not going to learn as much, but you can really start picking up more. I love watching, you know, two really good fighters just go at it and practice for 20, 30 minutes and, you know, storing every bit of it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, do you have a hero in the SCA? And if so, who is it? Too many to count. I have, I have, you know, um, too many to count. Okay. They all know who they are. What is your favorite medieval-esque or period movie? Uh, Excalibur, Highlander, etc. Um, there's one movie I don't understand, Blood of Heroes. I don't understand why everybody loves that movie. I don't get it. Um, it's just I think it's Rucker Hauer. Like people just have I, a thing for Rucker Hauer. Well, go watch Blind Fury then. You don't watch a, you know, watch Split Second or some, you know, Ten of Nighthawks. <laughs> what book do you think everyone on the path to knighthood should read? Uh. That's a really good question. Um, it depends on what they, you know, I bought every dumb fighting manual that every, they're not dumb, but that every person put out, like if I saw one for sale at Penzik, I just bought it. Um, I didn't care who wrote it because it gives you a different insight into to a different way of looking at fighting and, um, understanding how and why people look at certain things on the field is very important to helping you form your own version of what you are on the field. So take advantage of, of that just to, you know, even an old one that was written 40 years ago, to any, any one of those books, it will help you build who and what you are and help you better understand how not just um, you look at fighting, but It'll give you insights into why you look at fighting that way because you can read it through someone else's eyes. And a lot of those old manuals are available in the files section of either this um, group or other groups. Um, I know I have collected them over the years and I've put them up. Do you have a copy? Um, I agree 100%. Do you, have a copy of, do you have a copy of Duke Patrick's uh, Trump Loyal Fighting I Style? Do. I do. <gasps> Oh, I need a copy of that one. Okay. I, I have been trying to find it. And um, it. I'm trying to find Duke Dirk's uh, Draconis one as well. I don't know if I have Dirk, but I definitely have Patrick. It's it's in here. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah. It's because, and if you want a seriously different way of looking at fighting, I flipped through it, but I never had, I could not get a copy of my own. And that will give you such a different insight into how someone else looks at fighting that yeah. it's it's really great for that. Yeah, he's all about like slipping things and and um sort of magician kind of things exactly it's, it's interesting 
Yeah. I had never thought about fighting that way until I read that. That's what I'm saying. That's like, like yeah. you, you get an insight into how someone else looks at it. And, and it, it gives you a, you know, maybe it'll be nothing that you ever use for yourself, but it's certainly a different way of, of thinking about it. Right, exactly. Uh, Jimerson, Kaz says he has a copy of Duke Dirk somewhere. So I'll get that from him. Mm. I don't have that one. <laughs> um, all right. If you could change one thing about the SCA, what would it be? Um, I would... I, I'm gonna, this is going to be really hard. I'm, I'm, I'm kicking the hornet's nest right now. I'd get rid of Masters of Arms. And um, I would also make it so that uh, knights wore golden chains, not unadorned chains. Yeah, mine's silver. I know that. I know. Uh, I know. It's just a, it's, it's, a, it's a bug for me because reading about knightly stuff, it, you know, growing up, it was golden spurs and a golden chain. And it just bugs me that. Like, I get it. We're not medieval knights. We're KSCA, which is something I have to remind myself of all the time. And our rule is different. We do something differently. But it's just like that little thing is stuck in the back of my head. Um, it would be nice if we had a little bit more um, consistency because you can't, from kingdom you to kingdom. can't tell. Um, no, no you, you can't. And there are people who don't know. And in some kingdoms, squires wear chains. And in other kingdoms, they don't. Um, but the, not only do they don't, but it's like way frowned upon. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I had a, I had one at one point and I, you know, I had to start wearing it on my belt because it was just getting so many problems. The, the master at arms things, I, I wish that's that when it first came up 50 years ago, that someone had to say in your oath, you can swear or affirm that you're upholding this. You don't have to swear by it then we never would have had the whole controversy we wouldn't have had that it everyone just could have been a, a knight the whole time and and that's 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 a horse i'm willing to, to you know hill i'm willing to die on there but not that i don't respect it i just wish it had been like thought about at the time and changed it definitely um it makes a weird dichotomy it's just it's Anyway, it's it it's nothing that's ever going to happen, yeah. but it's one of those things that a lot of decisions, a lot of decisions that are made in yet that were made in the SCA at the time to fulfill a short need, they didn't think that this was going to be going on for fifty or sixty years later. Right. So, you know, they didn't plan ahead, and here we are. Yeah. What do you think is the most important trait to become a successful fighter? Um, desire. And, and I, I mean, the desire to, to learn and become better, um, it will drive you to work out outside of fighting. It will drive you to watch the same video 500 times so you can see just exactly how someone got set up. It will push you to drive three hours each way to a fighter practice once a week. Um, if you don't have that, you might get good, but you're never going to be great. And then the last thing, um, if you could give somebody advice on how to be memorable on the field, like an unbelt, um, what would you tell them? Um, look good. Like craft a... Um, I've kind of dumped the whole persona idea in favor of um, trying to craft a, a good looking uh, outfit on the field or wearing a good costume. Um, and if you want to stand out, the easiest way to do that is be, go with something simple, but make it look really sharp. And people will, you'll always catch someone's eye. You know, you don't need metal, you don't need leather, don't look silly, but just make something that looks looks good, and other people you'll you'll stand out. People will remember that, and and it'll be very easy to for other people to talk about you um, because they can say, "Oh, the guy in the red and the you know twelfth century Ostrogoth outfit, or whatever, not an Ostrogoth, but um, whatever it would be." You know, that's that's so true. My uh, my husband, like right before he got knighted, um, updated his Roman kit, and people were like, "Who's the new guy?" Like, where'd he come from? 
you know, yeah. and like lost well, the same dude. Well, the worst, the worst, the worst for me ever happened. I was actually watching a video from when I was a kid and I used to have really long hair and I, I can't believe I'm about to tell this, but I'm going to do it anyway. And I was like, wow, that girl is really fast because the pony t- my ponytail was sticking so far out. And I was like, oh, wait, that's you in your new outfit, dumbass. <laughs> <laughs> I did that with a night up in Avicola. Um, he wasn't even in armor, but he had this beautiful hair. And I'm like, who's the girl knight? I don't know her. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for my pleasure and participating. And um, yeah. you guys, uh, you guys should go check out the Great Fighters uh, or Great Yay. Fight YouTube. Um, it's a super fun time. Um, yep. So anyway, thank yeah. you. And, My pleasure. Um, we'll see you all next time. Bye-bye. Yay.